Hey, Fedheads. Welcome back to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings from CigarFederation.com. Uh, we're, I'm your host, Trip. We're broadcast live around the world on the Armed Forces. Sorry, I messed that up. I got it. Somebody co- even commented yesterday that I got the whole intro. I nailed it, and I already ruined it this time. <laughs> uh, we're broadcast around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Uh, right now, we're live on Facebook, and then we're also available as a podcast or uh, on the old YouTubes. Um, as I said, I'm your host, Trip. here with my co-host, Dennis. Dennis, how you doing tonight, my brother? What's up, Trippy? Pretty good, man. And uh, in uh, a surprising turn of events, we don't usually have guests on the show, as you know, uh, but tonight we've got Tony Bellato from La Barba Cigars. I'm back. Tony, how you doing? Yeah, he's back two episodes in a row almost. No, you guys are going to get sick of me. We always are. Uh, and Tony's not just a cigar guy. He's also a wine guy. You are a, let me see if I still got it right, level three master of wine. Well, I'm, t- no. So a master of wine is what comes later. Is, is, so is I'm, like I'm, level five? You could say that. So like if I went, I would, I'm technically a WSET level three certified sommelier. Okay. But... If I took the next, if I took the next one, I would be level four, and then they send you to France or California for like six years for the master wine thing. That like wow. ten people. I think there's only like, to look it up. I think there's only like ten of them. That's, That's crazy. Nice. But the program that I took, the program that I took is the only one that you can take to like as an entrance to get in. So they they look at a bunch of different factors when they let you in the program, and that's one of them. Okay. Cool. Um, so we're here tonight, we're going to be, uh, pairing the La Barba Purple, as, or as, uh, as it's known on the, in the Facebook groups, that Purple Drank. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> which, I, I love that, like, people have just taken that and just run with it. <laughs> so we're going to be pairing it tonight, uh, out of our usual, uh, comfort zone. We're going to be going wine, all wine, all the time. So I'm looking forward to it because I I like wine, but I don't drink a lot of it just because I don't know a lot about it. Usually it's like with my father-in-law because he he knows a lot more than I do and he knows what's good and what's not. And, well, and you uh, live in wine country, man. I know, right? Uh, we're actually going wine tasting. Uh, I think it's this weekend. It might be next weekend. We're still figuring that out. We're going to Naked Winery out in Hood, Hood River. Um, they make some really, really good wines. And I actually found out about them through a cigar event. Which is interesting. Uh, so let's first let's talk about the cigar. How about that? So tell us about the blend in the La Barba Purple, Tony. Uh, so La Barba Purple is an Ecuadorian Habano wrapper um, with Habano Walta Bajo Seco and a tobacco called Carbonell that is kind of an homage to my roots in wine as well as cigars. It's a single family, single farm. Um, varietal of Habano tobacco that is very aromatic. Um, mm-hmm. Like I think last week we were talking about uh, masculine cigars versus feminine cigars, and um, I was with I was actually with Hunter last night, and he he he's my partner in in the wine as well as uh, some cigar projects. But we were he was talking about masculine, feminine, and then he uh, he changed it to something, and I can't, I was going to use it today. Because he doesn't like to describe things as masculine or feminine anymore. But anyway, the, we the wine about, took that from you. Yes. <laughs> so we were well, we were talking about uh, last week how you know Pinot Noirs are more on the feminine flavor profile and aroma of wine, you know, floral, aromatic, light, pretty, um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the expression we wanted to do with La Barba Purple. Um, so the the flavor notes of it, you're going to get like a little bit of white pepper and black pepper, but you're mostly going to get very sweet, very floral, very aromatic. Um, it has a very yeah. good room smell. And you can kind of pick it out amongst the other cigars. And then with the red, what we did is we, we, we made more of a masculine uh, flavor profile. So it's more spice-driven, leather, earth, mineral, those kind of flavors. So um, it's kind of the scoop on purple. Awesome. Um, and I should have asked this last week. Um, before I went out and selected my wines, what, what wines do you think go best with the purple and what wines do you think go best with the red? So I'm a, I'm a firm believer with 
food, wine, and cigars that you never want to. You either want to totally compare flavors or totally contrast flavors. Mm -hmm. And you know, with with foods, you know, you would eat like a Thai, like a spicy Thai dish or something. You'd want a sweet wine, so you have the spicy and you have the sweet. Um, but with you know some of the bigger foods, you can you can compare flavors to enhance them. But I always like to contrast flavors, so um, I always like to do the purple with Pinot Noir, not not okay. just because they both start with P, but because um, you know Pinot Noir. A lot of people, and it's okay to do. Like a lot of people will drink scotch when they smoke cigars. Well, if you drink scotch, like a very very smoky scotch, and you smoke a very smoky cigar, then you kind of mm-hmm. lose you kind of lose the nuances in each in each thing. Yeah, and I think the Barba body wise is is medium bodied enough to um, to hold up just to, to wine. And sometimes it's kind of you know you smoke a big like Maduro or something with a lot of flavor and a lot of body you end up can't you end up not being able to taste the wine anyway so it yeah know, it depends absolutely. It, it, it depends on how much you want to think about it you know if you just want to smoke um and hang out and drink then you could drink it you could smoke it with anything or drink it with anything um but i really like to pick out the little nuances in in um in both so on the purple that's a comparison so purple and pinot noir would be compare comparing flavors and if you smoke the purple with like a Cabernet, um, or like you're gonna have a Syrah later, I believe, mm-hmm. um, yep. which is another perfect one because because the the purple's sweet and Syrahs are very spicy. They're very spice driven. Uh, you get a lot of pepper. You get a lot of uh, like spice box spices. Uh, I have a Merlot to finish as well with the purple. So you can, I mean, you could do it as diverse as you want. Um, that's what's cool about it is you everybody has a different palate, so you. You experiment, and then you figure out what you like, and I think that's what's cool about it. Yeah, and speaking of experimenting, why don't we why don't we start doing some experimenting? Let's I like it. that idea. Uh, so I'm going to talk about my first my first pairing here. So uh, we talked last week. Tony's got his cava, which is a sparkling uh, Pinot Noir rosé, right? Which we he, do which got, of course, for tonight. Um, and I couldn't get my hands on that, but I did get some uh, some local Pinot Noir rosé. Um, so this comes to me from Underwood. Uh, there are a, uh, like we were talking about before the show, there's, there's kind of, uh, in the same way as cigars, there's wine, uh, blenders and then there's wine makers that, you know, they grow everything, then they turn it into wine then they put it in the bottles and it's all vertically integrated. Um, this company is not one of those companies. They, they buy from vineyards all over the state and, uh, uh, then blend themselves, but this is their rosé. Uh, they just started this canning project. I think it was last year, and so now you can get pretty much all of Underwood's wines in uh, in these 375 milliliter cans, which is of course a half bottle of wine. Um, and I, I find it's a really good delivery method. We were talking earlier before the show about how uh, if you crack a bottle of anything with bubbles in it, you're gonna have to drink that. Because if you don't drink it, the bubbles go away and you can't drink it tomorrow. Um, so this kind of gives you a half serving, which is good. Um, and the Underwood comes from a company called Union Wine. They started off doing the same kind of you know, uh, wine buying and wine blending. But they were kind of on the pricier side. And after they got some pressure from some of their friends who owned restaurants and stuff, uh, or just their friends who wanted less expensive wines, they started Underwood, which is their their you know, more budget line. So a can of this runs about uh, five or six bucks, usually up to seven, depending on which uh, varietal you're buying. So I'm going to take a couple sips of this. And uh, Tony, why don't you talk about your first wine first? So I am doing a shameless self plug on this one. Um, I am drinking my own product. It is called Viva La Vida. It is a 100% Pinot Noir Rosé Cava from Spain, uh, right outside of Barcelona. Um, I make the, well, I don't make the wine, um, but I would be called, they call it a negociant. So basically I drank a bunch of wine and I picked out the one that I liked the best. Um, So my partner is 
um, our gentlemen, two gentlemen, one is named Hunter Vogel and the other one is Andrew Lerner. They own a wine company called Treasure Hunter. Um, I was actually with Hunter last night. We had a taste in Cleveland. So my other two wines are also Treasure Hunter wines. Um, and I can explain what that, what they're all about, uh, in a little bit. Um, the Viva La Vida Cava, uh, took hundreds and hundreds of different wines from hundreds and hundreds of different places <laughs> in, uh, like cases and cases and cases. Tough and cases job. Like so when I finally, <laughs> I know someone's got to do it, but when I finally got down to the producer that I liked, um, we started playing around with the maceration levels and the sugar levels. Um, so how much time the grapes sit on the skins? Because you know when you when you make wine, when you press it, the juice is clear. Um, the reason why wine gets its color is from sitting on the skins. So uh, like Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs and white wines do not sit on the skins, where your red wines will sit on the skins. So you can have a white Pinot Noir if you would want to. Uh, it wouldn't taste very good, but um, they, you can still do it. Uh, point is. Uh, this sits on the skins. It's a real rosé, so they don't add they don't add red wine to make it pink. The whole thing sits on uh, the the skins of the grapes for eight hours. So that's how it gets the pink color. So it doesn't sit on for a full maceration. Some some rosés when they do what they call the dosage, they will add red wine to white wine to make it pink. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that. And then also our bottles are. All, all the secondary fermentation is done in the bottle, and it's a true method, so it's exactly the same way that they make champagne in France, only it's not in oh, champagne. Oh, wow. So only it's not in champagne, France, so instead of being $70, it's $15.99 at retail. So that's the scoop on that. All right, Dennis, you're up. Let's, let's talk about your first pairing before I actually and I get into tasting notes. For my first pairing, I revisited a, a, a company that I had probably like six or seven years ago and I forgot about and I really liked. <clears throat> and I think it was a, um, I think it was their Chardonnay actually, a couple of years ago. So my first one is a Chardonnay. It's an educated guest and that comes from Roots Run Deep out in uh, California. And those guys also similarly kind of source their, uh, source their grapes from different places. And in this case, it's from uh, Carneros. And the first thing that, of course, pops if you look at the label, it's kind of cool. Back then, yeah, it's I was, like a, uh, it's like a Goodwill Hunting thing. Yeah, a little bit. You know, back then I was in, in engineering school, and uh, I thought that was really cool. And uh, I knew nothing about wine. I still don't, but the label caught my eye, and and you know what, it got me into wine in general, but Chardonnays especially. It was never something that I kind of considered as a as a wine to try. What's cool about uh, the Chardonnay that you picked is, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, Pinot Noir and, and cigars. Well, Chardonnay is, a, is like a sister to Pinot Noir. So you can always, like, so in Burgundy, in France, um, in order to be what they call AOC, or like basically a certified wine from Burgundy, uh, it can only be Pinot Noir or Chardonnay because they both like the same growing conditions. Um, and they are, they are both very, very, they're very, very similar in nature, body structure. Um, they can be very delicate, very, um, aromatic. Um, but they're, they're very, very close. And then, you know, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon are also cousins, uh, which are on the complete opposite of the spectrums. But Cabernet Sauvignon comes from a crossing of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. Great. That's where you get Cabernet Sauvignon. Interesting. We're. That's pretty um, cool. I almost titled this episode "Wine Dummies" because it's like <laughs> we're we're going to one hour wine school right now. Oh, we're we're getting so, schooled, man. Absolutely. Yeah, because we don't know. We barely know what we're talking about when it comes to wine, um, and we're we're here <laughs> with an expert to guide us. Yeah. So, I I forgot to hold up my my glass before. It's it's very pale pink, um, which I'm. Interested, yeah. So I just saw yours as you held it up. Yours has more of like an orange color. I wonder if it makes me wonder if maybe this is like a, uh, you know, one of those fake colored. Well, they could have. It could have just spent less. It could have just spent less time on on the skins. That that might have been their intention, you know, to make okay. a nice because it's probably very light, and it's probably, you know, a little bit more approachable. Mine's a it's little bit more. 
intense. It's not actually as light as I expected. It's uh like it starts off light on the palate, but then there's like a really intense uh like uh sour cherry kind of note that I wasn't expecting. But I I absolutely see what you were talking about last week with uh, kind of clearing your palate with it because it really like it really punches up the flavors of the cigar a lot. Right. It it, it wipes your you know it. Everybody says it's the best time to smoke a cigars on the morning when your palate's clean. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that same concept. You know, you, you, you wipe your palate with the bubbles, and it kind of gives you a little refresher. Um, and it, it, enhances the, it enhances a lot of the, a lot of the things in cigars. And I don't know exactly why, besides the fact that it works. But, <laughs> you know, that I just, we, when Hunter and I were <clears throat> messing around with La Barba, a while ago, we were drinking. We would drink bubbles with it to just get the get the actual flavor profile yeah. of the stars down. And it's very it's very nice to to give those that first third, second third, third third a shot with bubbles. So I always try to revisit the cigar about halfway down with another, especially if there's other things going on. You know, if you're drinking other wine or eating or doing whatever, mm. you, know, you yeah. give that nice little taste of cava and it just clears your whole palate. Yeah, I really, I definitely get that effect from this. Um, let me take another sip and see if I can get some actual tasting notes out of it. I mean, it's like all, it's all fruit. It's uh-huh. sweet, like there's a, there's peach in there, but then it's really that like sour cherry note that is uh, is the most prominent to me. How's your kava pairing going? Great. Um, this specific wine has a lot of bright red fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little floral in nature, but it, you know, I definitely, uh, get, I'm getting the peach and the stone fruit, but there's a ton of strawberry, raspberry, uh, light red fruit. Um, it's very approachable. I know the alcohol is not that high on it. I think it's only 11 and a half. Yep. Um, so the alcohol is pretty low, so it doesn't drink too hot. So that's another thing that I like about it. You know, sometimes you drink wines that are real high in alcohol and, you know, a little over extracted and then they kind of taste like syrup. This is more yeah. of a like a uh, real light, you know, it's almost, I, I really like this Dasani sparkling white peach stuff. So it's oh, almost, stuff it's, is great. it's almost like that <laughs> nature where it's like a, it's like a, almost like a, like a soda water with a ton of flavor. Um, yeah, but it still it still gets you giggly, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Dennis? How's that? Uh, did you, was it a Chardonnay? I forgot yeah, already. Chardonnay, okay. and and I haven't had one in a, in a quite a while, a couple of years now. Um, I'm getting this like it's almost a uh, like a, a sweet yellow apple. It's a mm. little bit thicker on the body and an oak finish and i wonder how much of that is is coming from the cigar a lot of the initial kind of white pepper and and um floral notes of the cigar could be affecting that too and it's great it's funny that you mentioned uh mentioned apple because there's it's very important uh flavor compound in chardonnay so oh really okay yeah when you make uh so when you make chardonnay um or most most any wine um so let me let me kind of back up here. I'm getting putting the car the horse in front of the cart here. So you know when people taste wine, they say it's buttery. People taste wine, mm-hmm. they say yeah, it's not buttery, especially in Chardonnay. Well, there's a process called malolactic fermentation, and people do that to manipulate the wine to get that real rich buttery taste. And it's a yeast that changes malic acid, which you find in apples, especially green apples. It changes the malic acid into lactic acid, which you find in milk, butter, and cheese. So when you have, when you taste the wine uh-huh. that tastes like the green apple, then that's because it has not undergone the malolactic fermentation. So you're either going to have the apple taste in a Chardonnay or the butter taste in Chardonnay, but mm. you never have both. Interesting. Um, and what's cool about that also is um, when you do that, when you do that malolactic fermentation, then then the Chardonnay goes generally goes into uh, wood barrels, and that's where that process happens. So with the butter, mm-hmm. you're also going to get the toasty and the oak and the coconut from from the oak. But um, 
it's interesting to have a wine that has that malic acid where they have not undergone that malolactic fermentation and put it in a wood in a barrel. So you have the apple and you probably are tasting like toast and coconut and like some of those uh, like white buttered toast or not buttered, but white toast kind of kind of flavors. That's a, I think a cool thing about that wine is they kind of uh, they took it and they made it a little bit different than other people would because it would usually be butter and oak and not apple and oak. So it's a little tidbit of knowledge for you guys. Yeah, that's really interesting. Did you have any other notes about that, Dennis? Be ready to move on. Oh man, I just all I know is I like it, and now now I understand a little bit more of why I like it. Nice. Well, we're going to take a quick break for one of our sponsors, and then we'll be right back talking about, uh, I think we're all moving on to red wines next. We'll see. Yeah. Brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Try the 93-rated Heritage featuring a Rosado, Ecuador, and Habana wrapper, Nicaraguan binder, and Dominican, Pennsylvania, and Nicaraguan fillers. Blended by Gurkha's blending team at American Caribbean Cigars, it's hand-rolled Nicaraguan available in 35-count boxes. Talk to your local B&M about the Heritage today, or talk to them about other fine Gurkha cigars. Whatever your taste preference is, Gurkha has a cigar that's right for you. We're coming back. All right, and we're back with sharing our pairings, smoking the La Barba Purple, um, and drinking a variety of different wines. And I was just saying, I'm really impressed with this canned rosé. It's It's got way more flavor than I was expecting for the price. Um, and Tony was saying how, similar to, we, we talked about beer a lot on the show, um, and we actually talked about it last night. Like, the advantages of canning are immense. Like, it's... It's more package. It's more easily packageable. Like a case of wine is like I don't know, probably forty percent air. Like, and you're paying for that volume to ship it. Um, and in cans, That's there's fragile. very very little. Um, but the main benefit is there's no lighter air that can get in there. It's it's just not possible. And so the shelf life is longer. And also, uh, it, just the product you get ends up being fresher. The only the only disadvantage though I see is you it's you could never put like a something that you would want to age in a can because it won't nothing will happen to it it'll stay exactly yeah. the same. That's so like true. It's, it's that's for, a very good point. You know it's for but it, that's what's cool about it it's it's kind of like thumbing thumbing the nose at at hey it's it's wine drink it now it's fun just drink it that's what it's for. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that there's a place for there's a place for that but then in the same respect. You know how how long are you going to age a canned rosé? I mean, you're supposed to open it and drink it. That's the point. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to move on to my next wine. So this is another one that's not from a specific vineyard. They don't tell you what vineyard it's from. This is Christopher Michael Northwest Winemakers Pinot Noir. Um, so I I forgot to talk about the backstory of Underwood a little bit, but I'll I'll r- circle back to that a little bit later. So uh, Christopher Michael was founded in 2009. Um, by two brothers, and they just kind of wanted to make good Oregon wine. And they've kind of expanded a little bit. They've got, like, uh, a couple wines that are from Washington now, but they never tell you exactly which farms or anything. Um, But this one, I do know, is from the Willamette Valley, which is where I live, in the Willamette Valley. But it's, uh, as Tony was saying last week, they've got some pretty good Pinot Noirs here. It's just kind of a good growing region, I guess, for Pinot Noir. Yeah, it's uh well Oregon. The cool thing about Oregon is it's it's got the right soil and it's got the right climate for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And it's almost like, in my opinion, it's. I really like wines from Washington and Oregon, and be, and that's because it's like the Wild West out there, and yeah. that's the way that Napa used to be. But you know, Napa's has achieved a lot of success, and well well deserved success. But now, you know, Napa is more like it's very commercialized and. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that are. Um, and it's very expensive to make wine there, so you have to make you have to make stuff that people want to drink. Um, but the cool thing about Oregon is it's got that real cool climate, and then you know it also has it's like Washington, and it also has desert. So yeah. you can plant, you know, you can plant those things, and then you get that nice cool fog in the morning that comes from the from the coast. Uh, Pinot Noir. There's a lot of Pinot Noirs that are named like Fog Catcher 
or fog this or fog. I've Pinot noticed Noir, that. It loves fog. It loves to have that cool, mm. wet, damp fog to sit on it, uh, especially in the morning. And it likes real intense afternoon sun. So, I mean, I, I'm sure you guys know what, what your, what your uh, springs and summers are like. But, you know, yeah. pretty much rains in the morning and then it's really hot in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, and that's what Pinot Noir really likes. And then, in, in, you know, Washington on the other side of the mountain, um, you know, my, my adage when I, talk, when I talk about wine a lot is that really, really upset grapes in, in the Cabernet, in the Cabernet aspect, Merlot aspect, uh, really upset grapes make the best wine because they have to work harder to produce the sugars and to produce the flavors. You know, it's kind of the same reason why we, we pull tobacco flowers off the tobacco plant. You know, you don't want the, you don't want the, the tobacco plant feeding the flower because that's what it's supposed to do. Um, yeah. You want the tobacco plant working really hard um, in order to make great tobacco. And the same goes for wine. They're very similar. You know, you want, you, want the, you want the vine to work really, really hard to produce a really, really flavorful grape. Um, so in Washington, on, on the desert side, you know, you're going to have a lot of really good Cabernets, uh, a lot of really good Merlots because of that, re- that, because of that reason, because it's hard, it's hard to grow grapes there. Mm-hmm. So the, the grapes turn out better. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so when I was in Connecticut at a tobacco farm, the farmer was telling us about how for br- Connecticut broadleaf, a very important thing is when it gets way too cold at night and way too hot during the day. Um, and that produces like that thick, beefy broadleaf that everybody loves. Yeah, so I'm going to take stress. a couple sips of this. Yeah, exactly. The stress is what, what makes the plant stronger, which of course makes it more flavorful. Um, I'm going to take a couple sips of this Pinot, and let's see what, what your next pairing is, Tony. I also have a Pinot. Uh, this is Treasure Cellars. Uh, it's a project that Hunter um, occasionally comes out with. This is from the Kaufman Sunny Slope Vineyard, uh, and it's a Dijon clone 777 from Sonoma Mountain. Um, and I'll explain that to you guys in a little bit, but... Um, it's good. I love, I love Sonoma County wines. Um, Sonoma is also a little bit less, uh, it's got less notoriety than, than Napa does. And they, they really do make some great, you know, Carneros is in Sonoma. Um, the cool thing about the cool thing about Sonoma, like Carneros and the Russian river kind of split Napa and Sonoma. So no, Sonoma's on the mm-hmm. coast and then there's a mountain range and then there Napa is kind of, mm. Uh, on the other side of the hill, um, in another valley, and then there's another mountain range. So um, that's interesting that you're drinking the Carnero Chardonnay because the Carnero, you know, again has has that same kind of uh, attitude and weather where they're getting that those real cool foggy mornings, and then as the fog lifts in the afternoon, it, it becomes really hot. Um, so Carnero is one of my favorite regions for for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So. Did a good job picking that wine. Awesome. (laughs) Good job, Dennis. I'm trying here, you know. And what's your next wine, Dennis? So my next is actually a Pinot Noir as well. Uh, And it is from Toad Hollow. And so these guys grow their own own grapes. And they're based out of uh, Heldsburg, Heldsburg, California. Yeah. So Sonoma County, Russian River area, um, and I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you guys, the the label is mainly, I mean, I wanted a Pinot Noir, but the label kind of got me. You know, it's, yeah. it's classy. It's kind of like, I, I, I do the same thing with beer. If I like the label, if I like the packaging, it it kind of sways me to the purchase, depending yeah, I mean, on the that's style. The, that's the easiest way for a uh, for a winemaker to let you know their wine is good. Um, or unfortunately for a bad winemaker to let you know their wine is bad, uh, it's hard to tell, but, uh, if they've got good packaging, you know, they want you to at least pick it up and look closer. Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And at least you'll look at it. You'll read the back. You'll read a little bit more about it and you'll make the purchase, whether it's wine or beer or uh, even whiskey. Yeah. Or cigars. Or yeah, absolutely. Cigars. Very good point. Absolutely. So. My Pinot is like I, I think if you gave me like I don't know 
see, I don't even know what's close to Pinot Noir. Like, I couldn't pick a Pinot Noir out of a lineup of similar wines, I don't think. Um, but this one has, like, a... So it's got a fruitiness, for sure. Like, a, I'm trying to think of a red fruit that tastes like this. Some plum. kind of berry. Yeah, maybe plum. Um, on the On the label, it says their tasting notes are pomegranate, marionberry, and cigar box. Ooh, marionberry. That's great. Yeah, so, so marionberry, for anyone who's not familiar, because most people don't know what it is, it's I have a, no idea what it is. It's a, a type of blackberry, basically, that's native to Oregon. So okay. we've got marionberry, anything you can it's think good. of. It's good. It's damn good. It's it's It reminds me of a blackberry that's sweeter and more tart. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually, guess more tannic, right? It's a yeah, little bit more yeah, tannic. exactly. A little more intense. And now that I've got that in my head, I definitely taste marionberry in here. It's got like that. It's interesting because it starts off like, I always describe it as dusty. Maybe that's what they mean by cigar box. Um, and then it's like sweet, chewy, marionberry, plum kind of flavors. I'm, I'm digging this one. I'm not sure how it goes with this cigar yet. Oh, and I uh, I wanted to shout out Ru- Ruben Goodblood and Jerry Stash. Just saying what's up. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you guys think about our pairings tonight. It brings out like a, a dry spice in the cigar, I'm noticing. Like uh, that, that white pepper is a little more pronounced with this one. But I think it actually covers up the floral notes a little bit. How about your Pinot Noir, Tony? So this uh, specific clone, the cool thing about it is it's... Um, so clones and wine basically are exactly what you would think. And they take, they take French varietals and then they make different varietals out of them you know, with science. I don't know how they do it. But... Um, this is uh, the seven 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 clone, and it is um, it's it's getting it's gaining some traction in California. Um, it's a it's a very rich, deep, dark version of Pinot Noir, um, and they're very 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 complex. Um, I don't know ex- I don't know a lot about it because it's it's a newer varietal, and I've been trying to find as much as I can out about it and trying to pick up wines that are that. Uh, specific but um it's it's really rich and i think it 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 bodes well with a cigar because of that because of the specific nature of it being very rich um i'm getting i get a lot of dark fruit for pinot noir so i get um i get plummy i get raspberry i get dark blackberry but nothing too intense as far as uh, spice. Um, it goes well with the cigar because the cigar is spicy and there's a little the cigar is spicy and sweet, and the wine is kind of very similar. Um, I get a vanilla in the in the wine and uh, some oak and toast. But I also get that dried that same kind of thing you were talking about. Almost, uh, you know, it's very there's a lot of minerality to it, and it's very kind of. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's almost dusty, and I, I like that. I like that kind of um, barnyardy. Um, I like that barnyardy concept, but I don't like it too much in um, in like French or Italian wines. That old world style of winemaking is very like chewy. It's very earth driven. It's very mm-hmm. dirty. It's very you know you taste tobacco, you taste leather, you taste like you're licking. A, like horse barn floor, like hay and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and my my dad my dad hates it because I he he really likes Italian wines, and I just can't I can't get into them because they don't have they don't have like that that fruit that I I really like fruit and I really like it expressed in my wine and I really like mm-hmm. the nose of a wine I really like the the floral natures of that's why I like Pinot Noir. Um, it's just a romantic wine for me. I don't know. Dennis, how about you? Your... Those, 
Uh, I'm trying to pick up those flavors coming out of the cigar and, and definitely the white pepper, but I'm also getting a, a pretty strong toast, um, toasted body oh, yeah. to it. It's, it's, the body of it is really picking up. It's getting creamier for me. And with the wine, I think the wine is really pulling out a lot of those spicy flavors. And, you know, the, the first couple of sips on the wine, it was really tannic and just super dry. And immediately I was hit with blackberry and I knew it right off the bat. It's if you, if you've eaten a blackberry fresh, um, you know, freshly picked, yeah. it's got that intensity to it. It's, um, it's kind of hard to describe, I guess. That's it's that, about wine. it, it yeah. hits you in the face with that, like fruit and the dryness from the tannins that balances really well. And I've always liked Pinot Noir. I'm I'm just not that experienced with Pinot Noir. I think I don't drink a lot of Pinot Noir, even even though I'm of course <laughs> right here in the heart of Pinot Noir country. Um, you should go on an Exodus, man. You should just like take off of work <laughs> for like three months and just yeah, just go taste travel everything. the Oregon. Be become Oregon a wine trail. monk. The Oregon Wine Trail. Yeah, yeah. Just don't get just don't get dysentery. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that'll kill you. you. Know. <laughs> and also, like every time you kill a buffalo, like. So, like, you have 400 pounds, you can only carry 25 pound, pounds back to your cart. Um, it sucks. Yeah, I, I, uh, I couldn't pick it out uh, from, from a bunch of different wines. I could not pick it out, but I know that I really enjoy it. Yeah, like, I could, I could pick out a, a rosé because of the color, and I could pick out a Syrah because that's yeah. the one that I drink a lot of. Um, In got a lot of ways, out. it's not like beer, right? It's yeah, uh, exactly. so it's many different. more subtle flavors it's, to it. Yeah, it's way more subtle. Uh, we got a couple shout-outs. First of all, from Claudio Groy from uh, from Mombacho. Mombacho. Hey. He What's says, up? hey, boys, and he loves that we're doing wine with Tony. Love oh. you, Claudio. I love uh, Claudio. Oh, me too. He's he's a great dude. And they got, uh, they got a press release out today that they are the number one tourist attraction in Granada, which is, like, awesome. that's pretty well cool deserved. that it's our factory. Very cool. It's the number it's one well, attraction. It's well-deserved. Have you been there? Oh, absolutely. I've been it's, there. It's an unbelievable place. Times. It's a very, very special place. It very, really is. Um, and I was saying earlier uh, to somebody how they kind of like, Granada's the perfect place for them because they get that magic of being able to pull in people who aren't cigar people at all. They go there on vacation and they're like, well, this is the number one place on TripAdvisor. Let's go check it out. And then they check it out and they leave with a box of cigars um, and, and maybe a new hobby. There is a bakery. There's a bakery there that some of the um, Mombacho guys showed me. It is they have the best cinnamon rolls in the. I am convinced in the world, and Claudia can probably tell you what it's called. <laughs> but it's like right, right down the street from the factory, and these cinnamon rolls are just unbelievable. All right, next time I'm there, back. I'm going to tell Scarlett to take me to the cinnamon roll place. Yes, uh, I got to make it out there. I haven't been yet. Oh, it's great. And then we got a shout out from life. Bob Langmaid. Uh, he likes to pair a Habano cigar with a glass of Malbec. Ooh. Okay. Uh, you gotta try that. Malbec's, yeah. Malbec's a cool grape, especially with, uh, like, a Cuban cigar, because it's Cuban, I mean, Cuban Corojo is notorious for being spicy, and mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a lot of people that even call, I think there's a cigar box Malbec. I think that's what they called it. But really? Mal Malbec, yeah, that's like a, it's like a brand, but Malbec is like, you know, Bordeaux uses Malbec in like a 1% uh, category because it's so big and inky and powerful. Mm -hmm. But it also has very like uh, some sweet undertones that they go. That, uh, Malbec is a very, very good um, cigar wine. Cigar wine. I have really? a pretty cool. Yeah, I have a pretty cool story about, about wine with that. So, um, in like the, I can't remember when it was, but there was a there was a Hungarian scientist that wanted to see what would happen if they planted European grapes in America and American grapes in Europe. So American grapes, we have native grapes in America. It's called Vitis Labrusca, right? So those are your Concord, your Vidal's, your uh, oh, okay. Niagara. So like in the in the New York, uh, like Pennsylvania, New York area. Um, it's where like Welch's has grown Concord grapes and stuff like that. Well, yeah. 
Uh, Vitis vinifera is the um, actual technical name for European grapevines. Well, what happened was there was this little bug called phylloxera, and phylloxera really likes to eat the rootstocks of European vines only. It does not affect American vines. It only huh. affects the European vines. So when we brought the American plants to Europe, we nearly devastated the French and Italian <laughs> wine industry with this bug. So all of these, all of these French and Italian winemakers, they went to South America because if you look at Bordeaux and Burgundy, and you flip it upside down, that's mm -hmm. Chile and Argentina, right? Just the growing seasons are six months different, so their winter is our summer, so on and so forth. Yeah. But they took the original um, rootstocks from France because they were scared that they were going to lose their entire everything, the entire French yeah. and Italian wine industry. So they started growing Malbec, Cabernet. These are original Vitis vinifera grapes. Well, UC Davis in California, they figured out that if you take a American rootstock and you put a what they call a scion, a European scion on top of it, and you put a little tape around it, the, the vine will, will mend itself and oh, grow wow. together. So all, uh -huh. of the, all of the vines in Europe now, uh, for all French wines, are because now they have phylloxera, um, are now American rootstock with the European tops. And the same with in California, uh, you have European... Phylloxera does not exist in, in South America. So they have the, their original vines down there, and then in, in Europe they have these American rootstocked vines. Wow. So you see Davis saved basically the, the entire wine industry wow that's crazy that's nuts that's that's just an awesome piece of like wine trivia and then it birthed you know it birthed the entire wine industry in south america where you're getting your malbec which yeah which is, is huge now yeah which is traditional french the real vines from france planted in argentina interesting all right. After I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think about that for a couple seconds. But while I'm thinking about it, we're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more pairings. This show is sponsored by Cigar Oasis. Don't spend all your time worrying about your cigar wrappers cracking, splitting, or falling apart from humidity fluctuation issues. Set it and forget it by choosing Cigar Oasis, a professional solution which provides equal distribution of humidity with precise electronic controls. Monitor your cigars through the internet using the smart humidor Wi-Fi attachment. Why don't you spend all your time enjoying your cigars and relaxing and let Cigar Oasis protect your cigars. Cigar Oasis has solutions for any humidor. Make sure you set it and forget it today. All right, we're back. Um, and Tony was starting to tell us a story, but I held him off so that we could talk about it on the air. Um, about why you are presented with the cork when you sit down at a restaurant and order a bottle of wine. So why is that, Tony? I'm very curious. I've heard it before, but I can't remember. So it was actually, it had, Thomas Jefferson had a lot to do with it, which is kind of strange, right? So Thomas Jefferson lived in France, and he had a house in, in Bordeaux, and he loved Chateau Lafitte. And back in those days, wine did not come bottled from the manufacturer. The barrels were sent to like a retailer Mm -hmm. And and the, you would go into the retail store and you would say, I want a bottle of Chateau Lafitte. And he would go in the back and open the barrel and fill your bottle. Well, naturally, uh, people like to cut corners. So they were putting their own wine and calling it Chateau Lafitte or they were calling it Aubryon or they were calling it whatever they wanted. But it was like yeah. their own backyard wine. So Thomas Jefferson kind of went to... Um, he went to Chateau Lafitte and said, hey, you know, there's people in town that are not are selling bogus wine. Why don't you sign the cork, put it in the bottle, and then dip it in wax, and then you guys should start bottling your wine at your facility. Hmm. So they started wow. to do that, and they dipped it in wax. So the presentation of the cork is to show you the signature of the winemaker that the wine is actually authentic. Very cool. And, th and that's why they do this thing now where they put that's the name why they of the still, vineyard? Yep. yep. Mm. Uh, that's a tradition thing. So the presentation nice. of, the, of the cork is is not to smell. It's it's to, to show you that the wine is actually leg legitimate and not from um, someone else. And in China now, they have such a, uh, and go figure, right, they have such a counterfeit wine market there 
<laughs> that the restaurants the restaurants will break like say you buy a bottle of Chateau Lafitte, which is like can be three, four thousand dollars, depending on what it is. They'll pour out your wine and then break the bottle so that they, to show you that they're never gonna fill it with something else and re wow. Oh wow. So they That's they break nice. it table side. That's just that, cool. Uh, yeah, that would be uh yeah. I awesome. mean, not even for the counterfeit aspect, but that would just be a cool thing to do at a wine bar. Just for, just for the experience, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just have them smashing it table side. Um, and I remembered while you were talking about that, the thing that I heard was that it's so you can squeeze the cork to make sure that it doesn't feel like mushy, like it's been corked. And also true. I mean, you can you can tell a lot about a wine by the cork. Um, if you look at a cork and it and say it's stained all the way up to the top. Yeah. Then that means that the the wine is might, might have been compromised, and you can kind of tell the the general age of a wine by the cork, on how much the how much the the cork is soaked up because cork is like a sponge, right? It's porous. Yeah, of course. And as you age wine, a wine slowly oxidizes, like a, like a, like when you bite an apple and you leave it on your counter, mm -hmm. it slowly oxidizes and turns brown. So yeah, although you know oxygen is a wine's worst enemy, it's also its best friend because you know when people say, well, it needs to open up a little bit. Well, the alcohol needs to evaporate, and and the wine needs to get its kind of its legs, so to speak, with the oxygen. Well, aged wine, when you age wine in the cellar, the reason why you can't age wine with like a Stelvin enclosure or a screw cap or in a can is because that cork breathes. So yeah. if it if it breathes too much or shrinks, then you're going to have oxi oxygen wine wine with oxygen. That's why when you buy if you ever buy a bottle of older wine, you always hold it. You always want to hold it up to the light and see where the neck volume is. Um, really? Yeah, because if it's if it's past, you know how they have the the foil. Yeah. The foil. The foil. The idea of the foil is to hide is to hide the empty spot of of air in the bottle, right? So mm -hmm. if it's it's below that you can tell that the wine is starting to be on a decline. So if you have a half-full bottle of wine with the cork in it still, then you know that the bottle's bad. I mean, there's no way you yeah. can, you know, the, all the wine's gone. It evaporated and oxygen took its place. <clears throat> Interesting. Well, I'm going to move on to my next wine. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, as you you were talking about Sonoma before, uh, this one comes from Sonoma, California. Uh, this is Thai Catton Vineyards Petite Syrah 2014. Um they say, let me see, it says it on the bottle. They're they're located, see, I mean, this, I read it before the show, and now that you've explained a little bit, I think you're going to know exactly what they're talking about. Located on the western slopes of the world-renowned uh, Mayakamas Mountains. Mayakamas? Mayakamas, sure. Uh, this is my, uh, my father-in-law turned me on to this vineyard, and it's now the only wine that I, like, buy and keep in the house. Uh, is from this vineyard, and usually it's their petite Syrahs because they're my favorite. Um, and I mean, it's like it looks Inky. black. Inky. Yeah, it's like even when I hold it up to the light around the edge, it's purple, but the rest is just ink, black ink. Um, you can't even see through it. Um, and I realized just now that I've I've been forgetting to talk about the price ranges because uh, with beer it doesn't really matter because you're paying somewhere between you know two and eight bucks a can or whatever. Um, and it's a pretty small range. So this one is my most expensive wine of the night. I think this one's about 35 or 40 bucks a bottle. Um, but it's good. I'm going to, I'm going to drink some of this while Tony talks about his last wine. And if you can, what I would do or try to do is take a little sip of your bubbles. Start over. Okay. Again. Um, because I think you'll be like, wow, this is crazy. And then to, to taste the cigar again and go back to the wine. Um, my last wine is the is a brand new offering from Treasure Hunter. It's called the Double Wide Merlot <laughs> from Walla Walla, Washington. Mm. Um, so I, I touched briefly on, on Treasure Hunter and what kind of they're all about. So Hunter... And Andrew, um, who are – Hunter is one of my best friends. So Hunter and I – Hunter is a partner with La Barba. He helped me get that – get the whole project off the ground. Um, and he's done countless amounts of things with my crazy 
like I want to do this project and he's like okay you know so he's he's helped me I mean with Viva La Vida he's like you want to do a rosé cava like what <laughs> but he he went with it with me and and he is he's an awesome French fort well Hunter has his background in wine uh, he used to own a wine called Kit Fox um, and Andrew used to own a wine called Dark Horse which I'm sure you're familiar with oh yeah I've heard of that one yeah um, so in the Treasure Hunter series, um, we were talking about negotiants earlier. So a negotiant is someone that will find great wines. So Viva La Vida is a negotiant brand, right? I found this great wine and I package it, market it and, and get it to the people that should be drinking it. Um, so if you see like, you'll see a lot in, in Burgundy, uh, like Louis Jadot or Albert Biggio or, or a lot of these people that their name is on the bottle of wine. So they'll go and there might be some mom pop, you know, wine grower that's just making this outrageously good wine, but they're not, they're not focused on the packaging or the bottles. They just drink it for themselves and they drink it out of the barrel. Probably what a negotiant does is says your wine is phenomenal. I would like to I would like to purchase it and resell it uh, under my negotiant label. So people fall in love with with the uh, basically the the palette of the the negotiant. Mm-hmm. And with the treasure hunter brand specifically, uh, that's what Hunter does. And he finds this incredible wine. I mean, hence the name Treasure Hunter. You know, he finds this incredible wine. And there may only be 200 cases or 300 cases of it. And he buys it. And it's supposed to be something that you drink right now. It's supposed to be wonderful. Everyone is. And they're all like 20 bucks a bottle. So it's, you know, you you can have a a wine that drinks like $100. You can have a wine that drinks like $150. You know, he never tells where he gets it. But, you know, over the years, I... The reason why I met Hunter was I was in wine school and I could not afford to drink hundred and hundred and fifty dollar bottles of wine. Um, so Hunter sat down with me at a wine taste and said, "Well, these are the things that make this wine what it is. This is why it's as expensive as it is, and so on and so forth." Mm-hmm. Um, but on the label itself, it says Treasure Hunter, right? And it says, we discovered double wide of which is a Merlot from Walla Walla Valley. So every time, so every time he comes out with something, I scoop up as much as I can. And, um, because once it's gone, it's gone forever. Yeah. So, um, I think it's a really cool concept and, um, you get to drink a lot of great wine that's 20 bucks and that's it. You know, it's like, you can't beat that. It just it's just really great it's a really great wine to drink all the time so every so in my house I have that's what I drink I just drink treasure hunter because it's always good and then next week there's gonna be something cool that comes out that's just as good or better so yeah, yeah. Um, and it's worth noting that you kind of co-opted this idea for uh, impromptu which eventually turned into lost and found um, which it's the same exact concept maybe. <laughs> all right maybe i did let's uh move on to dennis's final wine and and see what that is all right so my final wine also from california from uh well i'm confused because it says santa maria california but then on the front it says paso robles california so i don't know is that the same Place or one is probably where they grow it, and and one is probably where they bottle it and With distribute the bottle it. it. So okay, makes sense. Okay, so Lady of the Mandrake, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon. That's a cool label. It's a very nice label, man. I've never um, seen that before. That's a really cool label. It really, it really popped, you know, at me, and uh, it's dedicated to Aphrodite. So all about pleasure and enjoying the uh, the many different things in life. Uh, it is it's beautiful. It's just really nice to look at. My camera doesn't do it justice. It's very compared to all the wines I've had tonight so far. Really, what, what kind of what you would call a full body? 
It's a lot sweeter. Mm -hmm. It's a lot thicker. And it plays off the cigar really nicely. The cigar is, now that it's warmed up, I'm pretty much in the kind of getting to the final third. Um, oh, you got that the, old band. Yeah. Is it? The, is I it, didn't notice yeah. that before. We were trying to show that off last week. Oh, um, really? Of course, it won't focus, but. I need a better camera. Absolutely. Uh, the new bands just pop, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Although I kind of like the old band too, it's nice. The purple on it is cool. Um, it's so as it's same, warmed up, sorry, it's actually the same. It's exact same color, but you can tell the difference of paper. on the paper. So it's weird oh, because I, that's like on a shiny, is. yeah, like on a shiny paper, the purple comes out, but it's exactly the same pantone color. I see. Color. Okay. But, Interesting. Oh, cool. Okay. I didn't realize that. I assumed it was a darker purple on the newer bands. Hmm. Mm. So I'm getting a lot of really nice, even though it's it's nicely warmed up, I'm getting a lot of really nice floral notes that are playing off of the, the wine. And so far, I think this is my favorite wine of the night. What Just varietal? because it's so chewy. What varietal was it again? I'm sorry, I missed that part. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. All right, we're going to take a quick break before I talk about uh, how my final wine tastes. Uh, but we're not going anywhere because this segment is brought to us by... Who are they brought to us by, Dennis? Drew Estate. They good. Absolutely, man. Go on uh, safari, get some stuff painted. Exactly. Oh, and I'll hold up mine. <laughs> like, uh, so Yours is awesome. My favorite thing to do, uh, they'll paint whatever you want on stuff. Like, If you can think of it, they'll paint it. Um, but my favorite thing to do any. is just tell them to paint whatever they want. Um, and I ended up with this, which I don't know who the original model is. Because they basically just find a picture on Instagram and paint it with a mouse face. <laughs> or rat face, rather. Um, but it turned out pretty sweet. So I actually have an, acid, I have an acid hard helmet somewhere. I know I do. Yeah, exactly. Like, they'll, they'll paint anything, and they just paint cool stuff on it. Like, no matter what it is, it's gorgeous. So this one, uh, I th this is my favorite pairing, too. Because, like I said before, this is... Probably my favorite wine that I that I can get kind of semi regularly, um, and it's like it starts off sweet and with like stewed berries, kind of like uh, stewed raspberries, maybe stewed blackberries, like kind of a mix of of all the different kinds of berries stewed. That's like got that rich sweetness and sugariness with a little bit of like cinnamon and spice, um, and then it finishes like almost leathery, I want to say. But it brings out so much of the floral quality in the cigar that I love this pairing. You like Petit Sera a lot. I, I really like Petit Sera. We were talking earlier about how, you know, Petit Sera has that very... It's a very good cigar wine. Um, mm -hmm. Because it has like a lot of a lot of those comparison flavors, you know, like the white pepper, yeah, uh, leather, um, but it also has like a like a jammy kind of yeah, exactly. Like a, yeah, to, jammy is a good way to put it. But it's not. It, it, Petit Sirah is a really fun wine to play with, especially with foods and cigars. Um, I like I like that. I like Petit Sirah a lot. I haven't had one in a while. I think I'm going to drink one tomorrow. Nice. <laughs> uh -huh. um, if if you see Ty Catton's Petite Syrah, give it a shot. I like. I don't. It we don't get lot. that. That we don't get that over here. I don't know why. No. Oh. Um. Well, I. I don't think we get it locally at all. I order it all online because they have. Uh, I don't want to blow up their spot because. I might start losing out a little bit, but. Um, I think it's two or three times a year on their website. They have 50% off everything. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. So usually my father-in-law and I split a couple of cases of just several different wines. And he's he's become kind of friends with their um, with the people down there. So, you know, he can say, I want a quarter case of this and a half a case of this and two cases of this. And they'll, they'll hook it up. And um, we get a, so something like this ends up being like, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, which crazy. is very reasonable for what it is. Well, when I send you when I send you guys the Viva, you can take that shipping box and <laughs> send it on back. I can do that. 
how about how about your last one, Tony? How's that shaping up? Uh, awesome. You know, Merlot is a very, you know, got kind of a bad rap from the movie a while ago. That, it's the only thing I think of. Every time I hear the word yeah, Merlot, yeah, I think, yeah, I am true. not drinking Merlot. Yep. <laughs> um, but it is, you know, the, that movie is very, it's very funny to watch it as a super wine geek because, you know, he talks about how he's, he hates Merlot, right? He hates it, he hates it, he hates it. And he talks about Pinot Noir and how Pinot Noir is like this very delicate, very kind of passive grape, which is kind of how he is in the movie, right? He's very like passive and kind of like doesn't really say anything. And he, by the end of the movie, he becomes like this. Remember, he like drinks the wine out of the spit thing and then oh, yeah. ends up at the house knocking on her door. And it, it, well, it's funny from a wine perspective because when he says that, I'm not drinking any bleep Merlot, his favorite and most prized bottle is a Cheval Blanc, which is 100% Merlot, which he drinks in the, <laughs> which he drinks in the, in the fast food place. And that was kind of his transformation from the, from the, like the timid little Pinot Noir guy that he was into this big beefy Merlot, like I'm going to take action and, you know, go get the girl, which is kind of like how huh. Merlot is. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like him as a grape and his his kind of transformation from this <laughs> this delicate Pinot Noir type guy. That's a cool that way is. to put it. Yeah, and it really is. It's a very weird, you know, wine kind of thing. Where, but I'm, I was watching the movie and I'm like, I'm like he's not drinking any Merlot, but he's got the Cheval Blanc and blah blah blah. But either way, um, this wine is very very good. It's very very good, and it's. You know, as the cigar develops and you start to get that kind of, you know, you have that, that looming kind of flavors in your mouth from the cigar that don't go away, it, it, uh, it accents this wine very well. <clears throat> because it's got enough fruit and enough of that kind of general sweetness to, um, to counteract how spicy the cigar is getting now in its mm -hmm. final third. Um, but it also has the body and the structure to hold up to the smokiness of the cigar, which is, which is often something that, you know, as you smoke a cigar and drink different wines, is something that either you're tasting the cigar or you're tasting the wine. You're not tasting yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. We see that and, with beer a lot. Right. And, you know, you drink those big, like a big stout and you, if, like if you smoked a Connecticut cigar and you drank a stout, like, what are you going to taste more? You're going to taste the, the, the stout more, but with this. Excuse me, I have the hiccups now. But with this, you know, you're getting, you get the fruit, the structure, the boldness, the bigness. You're getting very elegant tannin. Um, but you can still taste the cigar. And then sometimes the opposite happens when you're smoking a cigar and drinking wine where all you can do is taste the cigar. The cool thing about the Merlot is you can, you can definitely still pick out the flavors of the Merlot, even though I've been smoking the cigar for an hour already. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very cool combination and, uh, the wine is very well done. So, um, that's what I got to say. Well put. What about yours, Dennis? I'm really digging just how juicy it is. It's not very strong on the tannins. Um, but it's the, the sweetness on it is balancing a lot of the spice from the cigar. It's sitting really well. And I think it's a really good pairing for me. Now, would you have liked? Would you have liked the the Cabernet at the beginning of the cigar, or do you think that the 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 progression you had progressed with the cigar? If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think the progression was actually better for me. I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. At, and we talk about this with with a lot of the beers too. That progression is really important. As the cigar develops, you want to sort of match the that point where the cigar is at. And this would have been not as good at, at the beginning. And similarly, you know, a lot of the other wines I had kind of wouldn't have fit the same way at the end of the cigar as they did at the, you know, the first third and then the second third. So the progression is is nice. And I think that's okay, too. Um, a lot of people kind of get stressed and they feel like they have to pick one thing and stick with it the entire experience of a cigar. Realistically, have a couple of different things. You know, match whatever it is that you, you get from the cigar. Match that with, with your drink of choice. Nothing wrong yeah, with that. I'm, I'm a big proponent of of doing it like kind of um, 
in this particular pairing, it worked out better than most. Um, where I feel like my first drink went really, really well with the first third of the cigar. Um, but it's really kind of getting blown out by the pepperiness of the the final third. And the second wine went really well with the, with the middle third. Uh, and then this like full-bodied, intense wine goes really well with the final third. Did you? What did you think about going back to the bubbles after um, after? It it, th- it doesn't have as much flavor, of course. Like, right. you know, my palate is covered up now with these darker, redder wines. Um, but I have been going back to it to clear my palate, um, and I really do like. After I have a sip of that, I take a draw on the cigar and then have a sip of the uh, Syrah, and I really taste the cigar a lot more. So, I mean, the lesson is always have three bottles of wine with cigars. <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. And always have a bottle of Viva La Vida <clears throat> on backup. Exactly. Exactly. What was your uh, pairing of the night, Tony? Dennis and I have already said ours. My, mine was definitely the, uh, the, the Pinot Noir on... Um, I think that goes really well with the cigar. I know. I think it's for some. You know, if we would have smoked a red, it would have been a totally different experience. But I just, you know, I think that that this cigar is made for Pinot Noir, and Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with Pinot Noir. So when I made the cigar, I guess I had it in mind. Um, But you know, I just especially this this Treasure Cellars, the clone seven 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 because it's it's so big for Pinot Noir. That sometimes, you know, with, with like we, we've been talking about the entire show, is you you kind of can get overshadowed by one thing or another. Mm-hmm. And I think that the I think that the Pinot uh, really showed its true nature in that it was able to keep up with with the cigar the entire time um, I smoked and drank. And I think that that's really cool. So my my pairing is definitely I could I could drink the whole bottle of Pinot. And smoke the whole cigar. And I probably will after I get off of the phone. <laughs> so I have another one. Nice. Yeah. But you All know, right, well. You know, you know a wine and a cigar is good when, when you stop. You know, we were talking about Sampre last week, and I know we're running out of time. But, you know, it, you can really tell when something is good when you forget about it, if that makes any in, in the middle of doing it. Yeah. So, like, if you're smoking a cigar and drinking wine, and then all of a sudden, like, like what happened to my cigar? What happened to my wine? I'm drunk and I'm happy, but you didn't even realize. You know, you didn't even realize it. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you're like, what happened to the last two hours of my life? Let's open another bottle of wine and smoke another cigar. But you know, it's good when you when you get done with it and you don't expect to be done with it. You know. Yeah, um, I I've been noticing that a lot. Like as we've been going through the show, I've been looking at my cigar, going, "How did I smoke that much of this cigar?" Um, and it's just because it's, I'm enjoying it, and it's really good, and I'm not thinking about. And it like, doesn't take any work. Every step right. of the process. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. We went a little bit over, which is always fine, um, and always fun. Uh, thank you guys for watching or listening. We appreciate you guys out there. Uh, of course, thank you to all of our Armed Forces Radio Network listeners. Um, we know you guys are out there doing things we're not built to do, uh, and we can't thank you enough. And remember, here on Sharing Our Pairings, we want you to drink better, but we want you to drink less.